Good evening, your dear friends. You are new friends uh, for some I, I, I don't know. Uh, and thank you for coming tonight to attend this debate about the hidden message behind uh, Kafka writings and Rembrandt's paintings. <laughs> I'm very happy to share this moment with you tonight where we will listen to Zenia Gershman and Andreas Kilcher. Zenia Gershman is an internationally re re renowned artist. In addition to her artistic career, Gershman is a Rembrandt specialist and a museum educator. She has worked for over a decade in the Getty Museum as a co-founder co and president of Project O, a non-profit non foundation for the arts. Gershman has dedicated her scholarly and charitable work to provide new dimension in understanding the cultural icons of Western European heritage. And Andreas Kilcher is professor of literature and cultural studies at the Eidgenossische Technische Hochschule. That's it? Okay, good, thank you. That means, that means, that, that means the Federal Technical University of Zurich. In Switzerland. Uh, he's a prominent scholar of German Jewish literature and culture, Kabbalah, and the European tradition of esotericism. He has written and edited a range of publications on the, account, the encounters between European and Jewish cultures from the 16th centuries through the present with a focus on the 20th century. And uh, I am Christian Grusk, <laughs> president of the American Institute of Levinasian Studies, whose main work is based around the thinking of Emmanuel Levinas, the French philosopher, of phenomenology, and I'm pleased to moderate this debate, which will follow, which will follow. But before, I would like to make some introductions, uh, commentary. As you will have read in the statement of the subject, there will be a question of secret and a possibility of a link with Kabbalah. So more than a secret, in the sense of what can be said or seen, it seems rather that. What is hidden in Kafka writings and in Rembrandt's paintings would be invitations to think beyond than what is visible or appears. To see well a picture, to imbibe text, and to take pleasure in it, it is sometimes necessary merely to be attentive to a detail, a color, a phrase, an object, a word even missing, a fracture of meaning, and intelligence stops. Intrigued. And it's here that a work of unfolding begins to restore the, its essence to the th threshold of the thought that created it, giving rise to a different understanding. And for those who love to read or watch, a new pleasure is then promised, the pleasure of understanding. Even an amateur, provided that he is attentive, even with a superficial approach to what appears as difficult, can sometimes extract essential suggestions for his own intellectual life about questions that worries the man of all epochs, of any epoch. That is to say, the modern man, as Levinas used to say and wrote. Picasso used to say that art issues our soul from the dust of everyday life. However, even if it can be reached by all, this requi uh, requires a particular personal effort, requirements, and exigency. Each quality artwork, in general, covers a, hi a hidden ID, like a palimpsest, that is to say, a writing or a codification of, res of representations covered by another, which must be scratched in order to discover a primordial truth which is the essence of the root of the thought that created it. The Israeli writer Aaron Appelfeld wrote that the literature, if it's a literature of truth, must be the religious music that we have lost. So what could be the religious music that we may have lost in relation with Kabbalah, literally reception in Hebrew? as it also proposed and suggested in the statement of the subject of tonight. Let us return quickly to the source. First of all, I remind you that for Maimonid, the Sinaitic revelation 
must be understood as Hedut in Hebrew testimony, the glory of God boasting by a witness. In the book of Exodus on the Sinai, there is a mis very mysterious dialogue between God and Moses. Moses said, give me a vision of your glory. And God answers, there is a place beside me and you can stand on the rock. And as my glory passes, I will put you in a crack of rocks and I will put my palm on until I pass. And you will perceive the back, but my face, my face will not be seen. By perceiving only the back, the way to entrance to Kabbalah is shown by the back of the school as a gateway, a place of divine access to the intellect. In fact, Moses wanted to have access to a deeper understanding of the revelation that he had already received, but, but not asking for a new Torah. He wants to know how God dominates the world. It is, it is the substance of that profound knowledge that Moses, Moses is looking for, the goodness of God, his essence. Emmanuel Levinas wrote in the New Talmudic readings, Torah is, a demand, is demanding. It is necessary to blow on the ashes of ideas and images so that the flame tenderly appears to man. Tonight, Zenia and Andreas will blow on the invisible points of these burning embers to remove the ashes and make the artwork of Rembrandt and Kafka flashing back and lighting up for us. Thank you. Now, Professor Kilcher, you begin. Before ask the, let's say, very attentive uh, what I will present here, a Kafka lecture, I have to say it's not a real Kafka lecture what I can give now because we want to bring very different aspects together. It's some ideas, some perspectives on Kafka, and I hope that we will bring these different perspectives and ideas together then in the discussion round, in the second round. Um, I want to start... Um, also not directly with Kafka, but I want to take up uh, some ideas of Christian, which means to start with Levinas and the idea of the other, and trying to show uh, that the other um, can be understood in two ways. Um, first, um, substantially, and then also formally. Substantially meaning the other, according to Levinas and to some um, thinkers I will present in a minute, the other can be the Jew or Judaism. And formally, and this is maybe uh, this equally important, it's also um, the question of how this other is shown. Namely, as something concealed, as something hidden. Not directly, not literally, but in specific parabolic, literary, or we will see also in paintings, in forms that are not directly showing what is meant. So these are actually two, you see, two aspects of this idea of alterity stemming from Levinas, one substantially and the second formally. <coughs> so let me start with actually the, the substantial aspect, starting from Levinas, who was thinking about Judaism as the other. What does that mean? Um, it means that it is, first of all, very hard to define what is Judaism at all. He has, he has written um, an article about uh, Judaism in the Encyclopedia Universalis, where he writes the following, trying to define what is Judaism. And he defines, actually, Judaism by its otherness and even more strict by saying that Judaism is an unclassifiable mystery. <laughs> and this is has, how he writes there. And this sensibility and this culture and this religion referring to Judaism are perceived from the outside like the aspects of an intensively characterized entity that one is embarrassed to classify nationality or religion, 
fossilized civilization that survives itself or ferment of a better world. Mystery of Israel. And he goes even further by saying that Judaism is a secret that cannot be disclosed. He says, does the wisdom convey its, meaning the Judaism's, interior and disclose its secret, even though it did not possess the power to resonate as a message or to issue forth as a call? Meaning that Judaism wouldn't have even the power, according to this quotation, to resonate as something explicit, but much more to be understood as something implicit or, yeah, mysterious, a call that has not been uttered explicitly. We don't have to think about Kabbalah immediately to um, conceive of Judaism as something hidden, or the hidden part of Judaism. According to Levinas, as we see, there is in generally something of an otherness in Judaism. This idea has been taken up by many by several thinkers, especially by his French philosopher colleague uh, Jacques Derrida, um, writing an essay on Levinas with the title Violence and Metaphysics. Um, very briefly, I want to go into that because it brings us closer to Kafka. You might think these are all detours. In a way, it's true, but I hope to make the link between Levinas and Kafka through this aspect. So violence and meta metaphysics, why, why this strange combination? What is, we have to ask, the violence of metaphysics according to Derrida? The violence is actually what he is calling even totalitarianism, namely the thinking of identity, which means to make everything the same, which also means to cover the differences. And like that, according to Derrida, the whole philosophical tradition from Parmenides until Hegel works by trying to define thinking through identity, to the same, the idea of the same. And the violence is present in the following sentence of Derrida, referring, of course, to Levinas. If the other could be possessed, seized and known, it would not be the other. To possess, to know, to grasp are all synonyms of power. So what actually Derrida is trying to do is to show that the other has to be kind of like protected and to be left as the other and not included as the same. Mm -hmm. It sounds very abstract, but... Um, it is actually very ab abstract, and this is this kind of French philosophy <laughs> <laughs> that uh, is... It's, it's, <laughs> it's Kafkaian, but you see, the, the, uh, the idea behind that is to, to cherish the other as something that has its own dignity and can be left as the other. So it's... And, uh, Derrida even says that it's a non-phenomenon, it's not, it's not possible to describe. Like Levinas said, we can't classify Judaism. It's a mystery, or it has to remain a mystery. Um, Derrida further develops this idea by referring to the Hebrew word, and the, this yeah, very specific code word, shibolet or Sibolet, you might know that, as a code word um, that can be pronounced in these two different ways in order to um, distinguish a social group. To which group do you, are you belonging? Are you pronouncing it Shibolet or Sibolet? <laughs> so that's actually a biblical, very, very known biblical passage. passage. And uh, Derrida is actually taking up this idea um, of the difference Mar uh, marked uh, through a linguistic um, yeah, variation to show that Jewishness always means to be the other. The Jew, he says, is the shibolet, 
witness to the universal but as absolute dated market incised singularity as the other and in the name of the other. I apologize because this sounds again very abstract but it gets more clear when you come to the idea what does it mean to be marked by language or Derrida enfolds it um, also with the idea of uh, the Brit Mila, the circumcision, to be circumcised by language uh, because Mila is at the same time uh, the word. So it means to be marked by the word and to be kind of limited to the realm of the words. And you see we, we approach now the idea of the poet, of poetry as to be marked by words. So the final conclusion of Derrida is to say that this, we come now to the formal aspect of, of alterity. The formal aspect means that this um, otherness is a kind of a linguistic expression, a poetic expression to express yourself not in a literal sense but in a complex and um, poetic way, using semiles, using specific ways to describe what you mean. And in that sense, um, Derrida quotes um, a saying or a word by the Russian poet Marina Tsvetayevana, um, saying that, that all Jews are poets. The Jew, so Derrida quotes, is also the other, me and the other, I am Jewish in saying the Jew is the other who has no essence, who has nothing of his own or whose own essence is to have none. I don't follow, I quote the whole passage, but precisely at that moment, you might be very astonished, we come to Kafka. Because <laughs> this is the question Kafka poses. Um, what, means to be, what means it to be Jewish? Um, first of all, it's a negation. It's a, not a pure negation, it's a kind of a dialectic form of negation to say something in a negative way. I don't want to, to make it too complicated, but give an example. He met in a sanatorium, he had um, tuberculosis already, in 1919, as he describes in a letter to his friend, Max Brod, a young Jewish woman, <coughs> Julie Woritzek, she had also tuberculosis, and he fell in love with her. Actually, it was his second fiancé. They didn't marry because his father opposed. It was very inappropriate. But uh, interesting is how she, he is describing her. Exactly like I just said, in a negative way or negative, positive way, it's a kind of a dialectical way. He says, it's an ordinary figure, and an astonishing figure, not Jewish and not non-Jewish. Not a German, but not a non-German. You see what Kafka is trying to do here in order to understand what is the Jewishness. So Jewishness is not something which is affirmatively described, but has to be circumscribed through negations. And what he, the, the way he is describing this young woman, who kind of fascinated him, <coughs> um, this young woman is of course very close to how he would describe himself as a Jew, his own kind of Jewish identity or non-identity, much more. Because his Judaism is not given, it's not affirmative. It's not visible, it's much more unsecure. It's hidden and in a very explicit way negative. I could now start with a long talk about Kafka and Judaism. Many things have been said about it. Um, I could talk about the historical context in which this has to be understood, like the discourse on assimilation, on Zionism, um, especially on cultural Zionism, with, in the context of that uh, also uh, Hasidism played a huge role. Martin Buber discovered Hasidism. Gershom Scholem did his studies on 
Kabbalah in the frame of cultural Zionism. This is a context which is important to understand Kafka, but I cannot go into this historical discourse. I want to go uh, or to approach the texts of Kafka, just giving a few examples. For us, important is, again, to keep in mind that Kafka is not explicitly referring to Judaism or to what is be understood as Jewish, but very implicit, very indirect. As a matter of fact, no single text of Kafka, no single literary text is using the word Jew or Jewish. There is no reference to Judaism in any of Kafka's literary text. This is really astonishing because, of course, if, when you go into his letters and diaries, you find several or a lot of references. But when you go to his literary texts, you don't find any, any kind of explicit reference to Judaism. Nevertheless, it is present. And that's where we can come in with this idea of the other, because it's present as the other in a way that is formally the other, not explicitly, but implicitly alluded. But let's, before we go to the literary text, um, address two examples of um, yeah, letters, diary texts that explicitly refer to Judaism. And we see they continue this idea of Judaism of something not affirmatively given, but something that is kind of part of a, of a struggle, part of a, a fight, how to relate yourself to this huge tradition and to this huge field, what is Jewish. And one of maybe the most moving letters Kafka ever wrote was the letter to his father in 1919, reacting actually to his idea to get married to Julie Wojcik. And his father opposed because it turned out that she might have been a prostitute. It was not 100% clear, but he opposed. And his son, Franz, was really devastated. It was traumatic. And he wrote this big letter, this long letter to his father, where he just saw how different they are. And they were different also according to Judaism. And this passage makes this very clear. What sort of Judaism was it that I got from you, he asked his father. It was indeed, so far as I could see, a mere nothing. You really had brought some traces of Judaism with you from the ghetto-like village community. It was not so much, and it dwindled a little more in the city. He moved to Prague. And um, in the city and during the military service. But still, the impressions and memories of your youth did just about suffice for some sort of Jewish life. Even in this, there was still Judaism enough, but it was too little to be handed on to the child. It all dripped away while you were passing it on. <laughs> so there was no, Kafka, no Judaism left for Kafka. Even from this nothingness, nothingness of Judaism, das Nichts des Judentums, he says in German, is not reaching the child. So he, that's actually the starting point of Kafka, the boy Kafka, the going to school. He gets nothing of Judaism because, of course, his father was an assimilated Jew. And that he, he actually expected his son to be, he had to follow this path of assimilation. <coughs> but Kafka did not. He was interested actually in Zionism. We come to that. Um, Okay, this dramatic letter marks this kind of negative starting point, the nothingness of Judaism as um, the way how he, what, he, what he got from his own father. A second letter shows how um, explicit Kafka makes um, this statement about Judaism. But again, it's not... 
a positive statement, it's a statement about the lack of Judaism and let's say um, the disappearance of Judaism into nothingness. And in this letter, which has been written three years later, sent to his best friend, Max Brod, 1921, he makes clear that all his colleagues, including, of course, himself, the colleagues meaning the writers, the German Jewish writers in special, they were in the same constellation. They came from assimilated Jewish contexts, parents mostly assimilated Jews in Germany or in Austria or in the western part of Russia, um, and expecting from their kids, from their sons in that case, <coughs> to follow that path. But they didn't find a new place, and they didn't find a new, I mean the sons now, they didn't find a new territory or a new culture or a new identity. They were in between this nothingness. That's what he, Kafka, describes here. I won't read the whole quotation, just the conclusion. And he says, one might, this is the last sentence, also add um, to these impossibilities of Jewish writing, of Jewish literature, that is impossible from all sides. It's impossible even to write. It's, as he says, an impossible literature, a gypsy literature, Zigeuner literature, which means it's a, lit a literature that has no cultural center, no cultural heritage. It's not like the German literature or the French literature, which has an own language and an own topic, an own nation in behind, but it's a gypsy literature. So you see, that's, that's how Kafka tries to understand himself as a Jewish writer. And again, this is not far away from this idea of the otherness. It's not possible to understand it. It's, it's in a negative sense <coughs> present and not in a given sense. Um, we now come to Kafka's writing. But still, this is the last, let's say, not literary text. It's again a letter um, that Kafka wrote again to his friend, Max Brod, a little bit earlier, 1916, um, shortly before he, for the first time, got engaged with his first fiancé, uh, Felice Bauer. And this is actually a famous photograph um, which was taken in Budapest. They both drive, drove by train from Prague to Budapest in order to kind of celebrate uh, the engagement. Um, and at that occasion, this picture was taken. And what you see, I think it's quite interesting, you see nothing Jewish on this <laughs> photograph. They are not Jewish at all. You could speculate what is Jewish about these two human beings. The eyes. The eyes. <laughs> you could uh, speculate, speculate about physiognomy. I mean, <laughs> uh, I think it wouldn't come so far. It's also a dangerous path, actually. Um, you don't see it here, but if you look very close, you could get the impression that Kafka is a keeper, but it's not clear. And it actually wouldn't make sense because Kafka was not coming from a religious family, as we have seen, and he was himself not religious. He didn't discover religious. What you, what you don't see here, they both were kind of interested in Zionism, but Zionism is not a visible Jewish culture, it's more invisible. So it's, it's very European. You can dress as a Western European businessman and being a Zionist. As, strong and ardent Zionist. She was actually engaged with um, or helping um, Jewish fugitives from Eastern Europe in Berlin. She was working in Berlin, he was in Prague, and also like her interested in Zionism, reading Zionism journals and having even the idea to immigrate to Palestine and to, uh, to uh, found a cafe. This was an idea he had for a certain time. 
and was never really, um, let's say, realistic. It was a very, it was more a dream. But she was in a more realistic way, kind of trying to help in the Zionist projects. That's not so important for us, but it's just the part of the invisibility of, the, of Judaism. It's not only that I want to come to his writing. Um, because Judaism is, of course, not only not visible on such photos, um, it's also not visible in Kafka's text. And that's what his, this letter is about. It's not visible, which also um, comes to the end that his text could be read in many ways. Even the contemporary readers, or already the contemporary readers have their problem. Are these Jewish texts, or are these German texts, or whatever? And this is kind of a funny letter that he, Kafka wrote um, at the occasion of the publication of his, of course, maybe today most known um, story, uh, The Metamorphosis, Die Verwandlung. It has been read in two ways, and that's what he's joking about here. Don't you, Felicia, also want to tell me what I truly am? <laughs> what am I? In the last Neue Rundschau, there is a mention of the metamorphosis, rejected with reasonable justification and something along the lines of case, prose, possesses something essentially <laughs> German. So the metamorphosis is rejected, and Kafka says with reasonable reasons, because Kafka al 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 always thought that what he is writing is not sufficient. It's not good. But not only that, it's re rejected because his prose possesses something essentially German. That's what he is quoting from the Neue Rundschau. And then he quotes a second review by his friend Max Brod. However, he says, in Marx's essay, which is, was an essay about Jewish writers um, and the Jewish community, he writes, Carr's narratives are among the most Jewish documents of our time. <laughs> and then the funniest part is actually Kafka's conclu conclusion. He says, a difficult case, meaning he himself, I am a difficult case. And I am a circus writer <laughs> on, am I a circus rider on two horses? And this would even be too good to just leave it like that. I'm a circus rider on two horses, meaning on German culture and on Jewish culture at the same time. And then he <laughs> says, alas, I'm not even a rider, but a lie on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of this yeah, self-ironic attitude that Kafka had all the time. But you see, there's no way to be explicitly or openly or frankly Jewish for Kafka. The Jewishness is kind of disappeared, is hidden. Um, actually, I didn't look at my... How, how long did keep it? Keep going. Can I <laughs> keep going a little bit? Okay, I do. Because <laughs> I want to come to two examples. This, this one I don't really go into. It's a very interesting little par parable uh, that Kafka wrote, a parable which is called On Parables. So why is this parable interesting for us? It shows how consciously Kafka did try to write in a parabolic way, meaning in a figurative language, meaning to use similes and metaphors in order to describe something indirectly what you can't describe directly. This, of course, is the hypothesis we need in order to understand how is Kafka treating Judaism in his text. And this is actually a very funny text, a parable, because it's also referring to Maimonides, who was very... Um, yeah, in a very classical, didactical sense, understood what females are. And probably you know this famous passage in the Guide of the Perplexed of Maimonides, <laughs> um, the apples of gold in vessels of silver, he quotes um, the, uh, the females of Salomon. Um, but it's, it's not so important for us 
interesting is just that the classical idea of the parable is that the simile has to show something. It has to be didactical. You have to understand something when you read the simile. And Kafka rejects just this function of the simile, of the parable. It does not necessarily help you to understand something. You can be even more confused after reading the simile. And actually this on parables is a small story showing that all these parables, they don't instruct anything. <laughs> I just read the first sentence. Many complain that the words of the wise are always merely parables and of no use in daily life, which is the only life we have. When the sages say, go over, means go to the other side, he does not mean that we should cross <laughs> over to some actual place. He means some fabulous yonder. Something unknown to us, something too that he cannot designate more precisely and therefore cannot help us here in the very least. All these parables really set out to say merely that the incomprehensible is incomprehensible. <laughs> and we know, we know that already. <laughs> so they're useless. They just say it's incomprehensible. <laughs> It goes on and on. There is a small discussion. What shall that mean? And if you lose or win in the parable, it's a game. It's funny, but uh, you have to read it. So I want to um, conclude with giving two examples in what way Kafka is actually speaking about or addressing, it's not speaking about, addressing, alluding to Judaism in his texts. And one field is actually you maybe would not expect it. It's the field of his animal stories, stories about animals. You can, of course, read these texts as texts on animals, or you can think about the whole tradition of the fables, since uh, the antique classical literature, um, which is an old tradition of talking about human relationships or our society in terms of how animals live together and so on. Kafka is of course taking up this tradition in a certain sense, but if you look closer, we see that in these animal stories he is talking about Judaism. Let's take the case of metamorphosis, for example, which is, I suppose you know the story, the <laughs> transformation of a human being in a, into an insect. You could say, very briefly concluded, that this is a parable of the rejection and exclusion of the Jews. And actually, this is a text about anti-Semitism. We, we would have to go in detail to understand that. Or we could take two other texts, Josephine the Singer and the Research of a Dog. So it's about, the first one is about the mice, a mouse, a singing mouse and her pupil. The second is about the studying dog. Uh, but they are kind of similar, these two stories, because both of them try to get to a lost tradition. The researches of a dog are actually researched about his family tradition and the f his people tradition, but he doesn't understand because the tradition is lost. And the people of the mouse, the singing mouse, they also try to understand what is this art, what is the singing of the mouse, and they kind of find out in the end that she's not even singing, she is silent. So it's a kind of a, yeah, loss. I think these, both of these two stories, they deal with the Zionist idea of renewing Jewish um, culture which means, of course, it's not just the political idea of Zionism, it's also the cultural idea of Zionism. Don't go into details now. Just the third um, story, I want to go a little bit into detail. This is the so-called report to an academy, Bericht für eine Akademie. It's actually a very funny story. It's a very positive story. It's actually, I would say it's the only positive story that Kafka wrote, <laughs> a story with a positive ending where the protagonist reaches something and is at the end stronger than at the beginning. It's a career of a monkey. 
who actually decides to become a human being. <laughs> <laughs> and I, my hypothesis is, is actually a text about assimilation. I just give a few quotations so you see that Kafka is taking up a, a very complex and very dense discourse on assimilation that was going on during his lifetime. It's a discourse that has, has been, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole debate actually from two sides, liberal Judaism and uh, let's say the, the classical idea of modern Judaism in the 19th century was, um, yeah, we have to assimilate. We have to get Europeans, become Europeans in order to survive. And on the other side, you have the Zionist discourse who says Zion, uh, assimilation is, is the self-negation of Judaism and so on. And this was a very, a very um, yeah, present discourse for Kafka. Um, but interesting is that in the end, what comes out um, through this process of assimilation is what you have just seen on the photo of Kafka and Felice Bauer. You don't see Jewishness anymore. It's actually a new kind of a moronic status of Judaism. Hidden Judaism. And in the story, it's described as follows. Actually, we hear the monkey with his name, Old Peter, Red Peter, actually that's the name of the monkey. Um, he talks about how he decided to become a human being. Giving up that self-assertiveness self was in fact the highest command that I gave myself. And you can already hear, you can replace actually a lot of aspects by, yeah, what is assimilation? To give up self-assertiveness. The highest command that I gave myself. I, a free ape, submitted myself to this yoke. Do you pronounce it like this, yoke? Joch? In so doing, however, my memories for the part increasing uh, for, so for, the, for their part increasingly closed themselves off against me. So he forgot about his origin. It's the origin, yeah, das Affentum, being an ape, a monkey, and you can easily replace Affentum by Judentum. The text works very well. And then, I learned, gentlemen, actually it's a speech for an academy, you are the academy, academy, I'm the monkey. I learned, gentlemen, alas, one learns when one has to do. One learns when one wants a way out, an Auswig, a way out of the prison, of captivity. One learns ruthlessly. One supervises oneself with a whip and tears oneself apart at the slices of resistance. My ape nature ran off, head over heels, out of me. With an effort which up to this point has never been repeated on earth, I have attained the average <laughs> education of a European. <laughs> die Durchschnittsbildung eines Mitteleuropäers is in German, the average education of a European. So like, yeah, to be a good European modern Jew, you reading Goethe and Schiller and dressing like any European. You don't see any Jewishness anymore. So you see what comes out when you hide Judaism. My second example is a bit more metaphysical and maybe it's more known and I will conclude very soon. <laughs> um, it's um, probably the most famous part of Kafka's novel, The Trial. It's called Before the Law, and it has been introduced in the trial, within the trial, as a parable on the problem of deception, meaning also of misunderstanding. Kafka published the parable also separately, but within the novel it's more interesting because there is a priest, and actually the, the, the setting of this the parable when it is told is, is in, in the dome, in a big church, and there is a, a priest meeting uh, Joseph K in this, in this uh, church. 
and telling him this parable and saying, I want to make you understand something about yourself, about your trial you are in and you don't understand. Because it is the case that uh, Joseph K, as you know, probably he is accused and he is involved in, into a process which he does, under, does not understand. He does not understand what's happening, why he is accused. And then the priest says, don't deceive yourself, said the priest. How would, it, how would I be deceiving myself, asked Kay. You deceive yourself in the court, said the priest. It talks about the self-deceit in the opening paragraphs to the law. In front of the law, there is a doorkeeper. That's how the parable begins. So we see in the writings of the law, there is just this description. Again, we can read this parable without any reference to Judaism. But if you look closer, it's a text that actually enters even Kabbalistic ideas. I don't want to go into large details, but it's just um, a few aspects. So there is this doorkeeper in front of the law, um, and the man from the countryside who wants, um, who asks for entry. He comes to the door and asks for entry. But the doorkeeper says he can't let him in into the law right now. The man thinks about this and then he asks if he'll be able to go in later. That's impossible, says the doorkeeper. Uh, sorry, that's possible, says the doorkeeper, but not now. What you, by the way, see, these um, pictures are uh, from the trial by Orson Welles. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a kind of, a, um, how do you say it? Yeah, it's a, it's a surreal scene where you, um, where the, the whole parable is is drawn. So it's, it's kind of a um, Zeichentrick. How do you call it? say that? <laughs> huh? Cartoon. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you see here this the law and the door and the doorkeeper in front of it. Um, then it goes on. The gateway to the law is open as it always is, and the doorkeeper has stepped to the side, so the man bends over and try to see in, to try to see in. When the doorkeeper notices this, he laughs and says, if you are tempted, give it a try. Try and go in even through, even though I say you can't. Careful though, I am powerful, and I'm only the lowest of all the doormen. But there is a doorkeeper for each of the rooms, and each of them is more powerful than the last. It's more than I can uh, it's, it's more than I can stand just to look at the third one. The man from the country had not expected difficulties like this. The law was supposed to be accessible for anyone, any time. He thinks, but now he looks more closely at the doorkeeper in his fur coat, sees. His big hooked nose, his long, thin, tatter beard, and he decides it's better to wait until he has permission to enter. The doorkeeper gives him a stool and lets him sit down to one side of the gate. He sits there for days and years. <laughs> Finally, his eyes grow dim and he no longer knows. Uh, actually, I omitted a long part. His eyes grow dim, he goes an old man, no longer knows where he's really getting darker or just eye, uh, his eyes that are deceiving him. But he sees now, um, he seems now to see an extinguishable light begin to shine from the darkness behind the door. He doesn't have long to live now. Just before he dies, he brings together all his experience from all his time into one question which has still never put to the doorkeeper. What well, is it you want to know, ask a doorkeeper? Everyone wants access to the law, says the man. How come over all these years, no one but me ask, has asked to be let in? The doorkeeper can see the man has come to his end. His hearing has faded and so, so that he can be heard, he shouts to him. 
nobody else could have go, uh, got into this way. And his entrance was meant only for you. Now I'll go and close it. <laughs> it's, of course, very brutal. <laughs> but you will ask, oh, good, OK, what, what is the connection to Judaism? Why is this a kind of a, a, a Jewish um, story? Um, or what is, how, in what way is it related to it? Um, many ways. Of course, the, the idea of the law kept by the doorkeeper and is not far away from the conception of the Torah itself. And uh, to understand where the Torah is coming from, meaning from upper, the upper sphere, um, is a very important topic in Kabbalistic contexts. And we could easily find um, Agadot stories, parables that tell like how Moses went up um, on the Mount of Sinai and received the Torah and had to pass the doorkeepers, which are their angels, each one more powerful than the last one, until Sandalfon, the most powerful angel, wouldn't let Moses in. But Moses succeeded. Very unlike to this man from the countryside, which actually is, and you could hear it, an Am Haaretz. And the Am Haaretz is the illiterate, uh, the one who has no education. Um, but I think this story, also regardless this specific tradition of Moses receiving the Torah, um, this, um, this story is very well designed to um, uh, show us how Judaism is portrayed in this secret way, the secret light behind the doors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think it's going to be much of a debate because I agreed on everything. So. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to, um, to thank first, you know, who, or to say who's first uh, to thank tonight. And it's our colleagues at AGU for making this event possible. Rotem Rosenthal, who's not here tonight because she has a little baby, but she's an assistant dean and chief curator and director of the Institute of Jewish Creativity. Lisa Silverman. Lisa, where are you? There she is in the back. Uh, she is a uh, Burton Sperbert Jewish Community Library Director. Uh, Carolyn Cohen, who was the programming coordinator, and Laura Beth Sholkov, the Director of Communication and Marketing, all made it possible tonight. But second, I wanted to say who is to blame tonight. And to blame is Rembrandt. Um, here we have Rembrandt. Um, a few years ago, I became curious uh, about enigmatic insertions of Hebrew in Rembrandt's art. And I decided to study classical Hebrew uh, so I could better understand the context. And I became, a, I actually started taking classes, fabulous classes here at American Jewish University with Sarah Har Shalom. And uh, if you're a student of Sarah, raise your hand. Yes, these are my tortured uh, comrades. We've been doing this for, for months now. This was, however, not enough. So I also joined uh, a course on Kabbalah taught by Pinchas Giller. So Pinchas, please raise your hand because he is responsible for everything else I'm going to tell you. So it was not being actually Jewish, which I was, but it was Rembrandt's art that brought me to Judaism and specifically to American Jewish University. And therefore, um, as a co-organizer of this event, I thought it would be most appropriate to organize this evening here tonight. So now you know who is to blame. Rembrandt's art is always moving, we know that, but it is particularly touching in his visions of the Jewish subjects. And now I take you, because this is such an irreverent lecture, it's Kafka, it's Levinas, it's Rembrandt, let's go to Vincent van Gogh. <laughs> when van Gogh visited the newly opened Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam in the autumn of 1885, he saw this painting. Has anybody seen this painting? Oh, we need to turn down the lights, yes, but not all of them. Okay. Uh, whew, uh, yes. Has anybody seen this live? Okay, 
When you see it live, it is really stunning, if, as you could even see in the reproduction. Van Gogh, as he was leaving the gallery, he turned to his friend and uh, he said so to the friend. Would you believe it? And I honestly mean what I say. I should be happy to give 10 years of my life if I could go on sitting here in front of this picture for a fortnight with only a crust of dry bread for food. Now, I promise I won't keep you here for, t you know, 10 years, but we do need some time to understand the profundity of Rembrandt's work. And this is also very interesting where you might say what is Jewish in this picture of the Jewish bride as you think back to the image that Andreas had shared with us with Kafka and his Jewish bride. I also wanted to show you that even in the detail, Rembrandt art touches us through centuries, affecting directly our hearts. Tonight, I'd like to focus on three central ideas. First, why would Rembrandt turn to Jewish culture and ideas? We understand Kafka was Jewish, but why Rembrandt? Second, the nature of the relationship between the actual text, as you see here portrayed in the picture, and the actual image in Rembrandt's art. And third, Rembrandt's emphasis on the prophetic and miraculous invisible nature of art itself. So to turn to the first question, throughout Rembrandt's career, we see portrayal not only numerous biblical narratives, such as Moses and the Ten Commandments, the sacrifice of Isaac, or Daniel's visions, but also contemporary portraits of Jewish uh, 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 subjects, as you see here. We know that Rembrandt actually lived in Beristrat, or Broad Street, for a number of years. This was the area not only populated with local artists, but also with Spanish and Portuguese Jews. It is here that Rembrandt both benefited from Jewish patronage, and he actually had access to Jewish scholars and ideas, and took advantage of them. Among his prominent neighbors was Rabbi Menasse ben Israel. What's special about this person that you're seeing here, he was the founder of the very first Jewish press in Holland in 1627. Rembrandt shared an interest with Minasa in Kabbalah. We've heard Andreas mention Kabbalah a few times and the Jewish mystical formulations. Another Christian mystic, Abraham von Frankenberg, emphasized the importance of Hebrew studies as the out outstanding, worthy, and deepest secrets are up to today perceived by the Jews. He wrote specifically that Hebrew language was the first and will be the last to be spoken on earth. He specifically, this Christian mystic, actually specifically recommended the Jewish rabbi Menasseh's publication useful for their understanding of the Kabbalah, magic, and alchemy. So here we come to the point that Menasseh didn't just share these ideas with Rembrandt. He actually commissioned him four etchings on the subject of Daniel's apocalyptic visions for his volume called Piedra Glorioso, or the Glorious Stone. Evidence points out that he must also have been the one who advised Rembrandt on his two most mysterious artworks that we will explore together. The first is Belshazzar's Feast, and it is based on the biblical account of the prophecy. During a feast in which the stolen Jewish vessels from the temple were used for entertainment of the Babylonian king Belshazzar, whom you see in the center here, a mysterious prophecy, can you see the prophecy? Known as the writing on the wall appeared. This is actually where we get an expression in English, the writing on the wall. The king's advisors and the wise men were called in to interpret it, but they were not able to neither read nor understand the meaning of this phrase. Of course, it was the Jewish man, Daniel, who was called into the court to interpret the mysterious inscription. And my first question to you, where is Daniel in this picture? So I want you to look at it. I know it's a reproduction. And where do we see Daniel who's interpreting the writing on the wall? Can anybody tell me? Yes. Is that the hand? So does anybody know what the hand is actually? Whose hand is, uh, is writing the, the inscription? It's God. 
sorry, wrong, wrong answer. <laughs> it's God, God's hand that's actually in front of you uh, creating this vision. But nice try. So let's try again. Where's Daniel? Bottom left with the beard. Daniel was a young man, so I should have told you that first. So that wouldn't qualify. And without torturing you too much, Daniel is not here. <laughs> why does, you know, sorry, I'm educated. I always do these traps. <laughs> so why did Rembrandt, the first question is, why did, didn't Rembrandt include Daniel, the main character, the Jew who understands? And in my opinion, it is because he wants to p position the other, in this case, you, the viewer, in the position of the prophet. He's giving you the power to read the writing on the wall and say, yes, you can understand it. They couldn't, but you can. And thus, he's making this painting to be necessarily, to be actively deciphered. So the second question is, who are the main characters? So we already sort of looked at the bearded man. We saw the hand of God. But it's interestingly, remember the story? Why did God get so upset and, and create this, this vision? Is because the vessels were stolen from the temple, and they were used during this Persian skin festival and desecrated, right? They were offended by being passed along for the party instead of this sacred ritual that they were supposed to be involved with. So the vessels themselves are the main character in this painting. And I isolated to show you what's, what's happening here. What do we see? Spilling, right? They are throwing up, they're regurgitating the, the, the unclean liquid. In this moment, you're actually seeing the reversal, the giving back, the erasure, the, the restoring of the cleanliness. And it's so smart for Rembrandt to include the vessels <laughs> instead of the Dan Daniel, right, as main characters. And also compositionally, if you take a look at how he positioned uh, the woman and her neck, it's very interesting how poetically here it's almost like a head cut off, right, or a mouth open, and, and you see the same neck the neckness of this, this image is really incredible. So we keep going. Now we get to the actual writing. The, the true main character of this painting is the writing on the wall. Rembrandt conforms to Jewish practice of forbidding, forbidding representation of God. So instead of uh, the image of God, we actually have the hand and the text or inscriptions replacing the image or the voice. The inscription is the source of the entire illumination in the painting. It's not, it's not something else that illuminated in the painting. You can see that the light is, and, and we had a wonderful, Andreas talked about the light behind the door. Here's your light, and it's actually revealing something to you this time. Rembrandt presents this message correctly in Aramaic, which is, you know, you can somewhat read it if you read Hebrew. Raise your hand if you read Hebrew. Okay, excellent. But it's, uh, he presents a particular solution. He divides the three words of five letters each. So we have three words, five letters each. You know in Hebrew we start, my classmates, we start on the right, then we go to the left. So can somebody read to me what it says? It's nonsense. Okay, so what's going on? Did Minasi not teach him properly? So um, he actually tries to recreate a riddle. Why weren't all these advisors at the court not able to read it? Because the message is coded, and you're supposed to read it vertically. So thus, Andreas, can you read it for me? Yes, so it's uh, uh, many, many tekel of farzin, which means numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. Great, we read it, but what, what does that mean? <laughs> right, so there's a second level of this parable. Uh, Daniel was able to interpret this message as the imminent doom of the king, the punishment for this misuse of the, the vessels. Many means, again, <clears throat> numbered. So he says, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, if you remember, was weighed. So you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting, meaning you were not heavy enough, not substantial enough. Ufarsin is divide, to divide, so your kingdom will be divided, and it will be divided be, between other rulers. And in fact, the prophecy comes true. The king is murdered, and his, this kingdom is divided that very same night. 
So what's interesting to us, um, uh, this particular layout of the inscription is very obscure, what you see here, and was unknown to Christian artists of Rembrandt's time. We don't see it anywhere else. However, an identical detailed solution with this exact layout is found in Manasseh's 1639 publication. So our next question that I'd like to ask, uh, why does the last letter look so bizarre, right? So this actually doesn't look like the N sulfate that it's supposed to be. It's shorter and looks, looks different. And some scholars assumed that maybe Rembrandt didn't learn well. Maybe he took these lessons from, from Minasse but made a mistake. And instead of rendering the correct letter Nun, he uh, put a shorter letter Zion and made a mistake. However, be assured that X-ray of this painting reveals that Rembrandt made a deliberate change. Uh, originally, he had painted it longer, and then he altered the original correct spelling and for some reason shortened it. So what could be the reason? The X-ray also shows that the position of God's hand was likewise altered. By doing so, Rembrandt changed the writing to be not just present, but in the very act of appearing, we witness God's finger still tracing the final letter. It's giving me goosebumps as I, as I talk to you. By doing so, Rembrandt changed, uh, um, uh, we, we are therefore transported, we right now in this very moment as we understand that, we are therefore transported to the very moment of the miracle in real time appearing right in front of our eyes. Quite amazing. 17 years later, Rembrandt returned to the subject of the prophetic words in the 1652 etchings that became known under the title of Faust, which is actually another uh, area of expertise of Andreas. Instead of blasphemous king here, we find actually a Jewish scholar. He can be identified by wearing, do you guys see what he's wearing? What is that? Talit, or Jewish prayer shawl, customarily, uh, uh, was, which was customary among the neighbors, the Sephardim neighbors of Amsterdam of Rembrandt, where he would have seen uh, examples of Talit. This scholar is engaged in, and actually we heard about the word Kabbalah a few times, he's actually practicing it. He's engaged in a Kabbalistic magical practice. Such process begins with a meditation and you can see that he was writing and he had all kinds of uh, uh, intellectual uh, uh, engagement. But such process begins with a meditation upon the divine names of God and the angels in order to achieve an elevation of the soul. And that's actually my secret goal is for tonight is for us to achieve the elevation of the soul. So, oh, money back. Uh, <laughs> Often this would be accom accompanied, this, this condition, this achievement, would be accompanied by the flashes of light as we see here. So notice that we have something happening here. A defining aspect of this uh, uh, Kabbalistic practice is the use of amulets or talismans containing the actual divine names and arranged in geometrical figures. As you see here is a very strange circle in geometric design. So such a talisman indeed served as a model for what appears to us in the window. So let's take a look at it. You ready to be elevated? Okay. So here we see a disc with three con uh, uh, concentric circles. And curiously, do you see this thing? You see the hand? One hand is holding it, another one is pointing. Can you guess what this is? It's kind of round and it's shiny. It's a mirror. Can you see that he's trying to kind of achieve an, uh, a reflection texture? So the hand, the mysterious hand, holds a mirror. And uh, looking closely at the disc, with this, and keep that thought, that's going to be a, a clue. Because what does the mirror do? It reflects and it reverses. So let's keep that in mind. So. Uh, uh, looking closely at the actual disc, we discover Hebrew anagrams of divine name of God. So here the writing actually begins at the bottom and is read counterclockwise from right to left as in Hebrew. 
and we have starting here and going upward Emrtet Algar Algastina. Who can translate that? <laughs> well, actually, you have to do a Kabbalistic practice, which means you have to rearrange the letters to arrive at the hidden meaning. So it means nothing unless you know what to do with it. And if you rearrange it correctly, you get Tangas Larga Latet Amor. And I, I'm sure you understood Amor. Uh, you will touch great depths. Love is hidden. Ooh, goosebumps, second time. On the other hand, the word alga, so we have, that was the whole sentence, but if you take alga just by itself, when read backwards, you get what? Agla. So when read backwards, as suggested by the mirror, right, the mirror becomes important. Uh, it can be deciphered as an abbreviation from the Jewish daily prayer of Amidah. Again, my classmates will be very excited about this because we also read Amidah um, for the last four weeks. So Agla, A-G-L-A, Ata Gibor Le'alam Adonai. How did I do? Okay. Thou, thou are mighty forever, O Lord. So again, you have sort of implication of the God uh, uh, hidden here. In turn, Emret. Can you find Emret? Where is he finding Amret over here at the bottom? It could also be deciphered if you shift the letters uh, to suggest the name Andreas already evoked, Sandalphone, his twin brother, one of the highest order of angels, would be Metatron. So rearranging the letters will give you another uh, important angel. The middle disk, if we go from the outer disk to the middle disk, would you like to know what it means? It contains the following. Adam. Can you find it? Te da geram, right? Adam de ad geram is men, I will guide you. So here you also have an invitation. Finally, the inner disk has also multiple possibilities, and it's only four letters now. You guys ready? Can you guess what these stand for? Inri, right? So Wait a minute, we're talking about Jesus now. So in the center of this circle, we have a reference to Enri or Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. But not if you're an alchemist. For an alchemist, Enri actually stands for Ignis Natura Renovatar Integra, which means all nature will be renewed by fire. This idea of transformation, like our souls, will be elevated and renewed. But not to Rembrandt. Notice that he shifted these four letters, and what did he put at the top? R. This spells rhyme. It's his last name, last name, okay? So within this talisman, he actually puts himself in the center with Christ, with whatever you want to associate, but it, it is a talisman, in my opinion, this artwork works as a private talisman for the artist. We keep going. So now, what I'd like to do in conclusion is to analyze these two artworks side by side. And this has never been done before. They're often talked about, but visually, when you actually don't talk about them, but put them side by side, what we see is that there is a formula at work. So now help me, what's similar here? Let's collect the facts. They're both turning both main characters, look at their positions, it's eerie almost, right? Look at the hand here, the hand here, uh, the way they turn towards the light, so the, to that light behind the door in a way. Here it's actually light behind or in front of the window or coinciding with the window. What else is similar? The mirror looks like the goblet. The, the mirror looks ah, like, almost like the, the, uh, uh, the goblet in the Balthazar's uh, feast. And, and somebody else said? The hand. The hand, the hand uh, at the bottom, right? No, the light. In the light, absolutely. The hand here pointing to the mirror, the hand here, they're, they're both active hands, right? So whether this is a hand of God and this perhaps the hand of God or perhaps of Metatron or the angel guiding us, but this guiding hand is so important, right? Do you notice also here is a table and here is a table and almost even compositionally, here's a round shape, here's a round shape. Here we have a skull peering, the dead, you're almost identical. He puts a woman. 
In the corner at the bottom? Oh, in the corner. Right there. there. Yes, this mysterious, that could be that, 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 that parallel, that rhyming. But you guys did so well. Thank you so much for, my, for the help. What's different here? The messages are, however, clearly different in nature. In one, we see a prophecy of an imminent end. In the other, a state of spiritual consciousness. So that the formula is the same, the messages are different. In both artworks, Rembrandt requires the viewer's active participation, as I wanted to show you, right? You don't, almost don't need me. He's asking you to participate. The deciphering of the secret message, and thus, most important, making you a co-creator. This painting and this etching are not finished without you participating. In Judaism, the relationship of the individual to God is personal and direct requiring no mediation of the church. So does the role of the viewer becomes personal and direct in Rembrandt's artwork. This emphasis on the role of the viewer and the miraculous, perhaps this was what it was that mesmerized Van Gogh in front of the Jewish bride. And I want to end with a quote. And this is a quote attributed by contemporaries of Rembrandt to Rembrandt. And it, they said that Rembrandt said, and even if he didn't say, I like it, a painting is complete when it has the shadows of a god. Rembrandt. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Zenia and uh, Andreas, for uh, showing what's, uh, what's hidden in, uh, in, uh, in Rembrandt and in Kafka. I <laughs> hope uh, the level of uh, secret is a little <laughs> bit be better for you now, because for me it's really hard, really. Uh, just I want, I want to come back to, uh, to, to what say uh, 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 Andreas. And I want, I want to point out, because he, he, he was explaining many things uh, concerning Kafka, but I think there is something uh, uh, that could explain what, uh, and I, it's a question I will ask him, of course. And, uh, you know, the problem with Kafka, it's not a problem, the, the thing with Kafka is, uh, he, is uh, he has a problem with the language. And his problem with the language is he's, he doesn't like the German who is spoken in Czech, Czechoslovakia. He has, a pro, he has a problem with this kind of German. And at this moment, the German is a language of literature, and it's a language of philosophy. And uh, he feels upset about that because he is speaking, he's speaking a German who is a, a little bit uh, uh, wobbly. So he, he doesn't understand the, the, how, to make, how to, to make it, and how he's going to be you're going to put his Judaism inside. So there is two things. German goes on this way, and Judaism goes on the other way. And it's, uh, it's what he explained in the letter that he sent to, uh, to Max Brod in 1999, as you, as you show, saying that uh, he doesn't feel German or Jewish, neither a German nor a Jew. In addition of that, uh, he feels finally as a stateless of the language and as his position he, he explains this in the castle in the novel the castle and uh, he say finally more I speak German more I want to reach in German and by the German language what I call the truth of my artwork but more I withdraw more I get rid of my Jewish being. So there is a kind, it's what's happened with what you, you are calling the impossible literature, uh, what, he, he, what he, he wrote as a gypsy literature. So the German puts Kafka out of his Judaism, and he doesn't know where to situate himself. That means he is he's seeking a promised language as a promised land. Kafka is moving closer to Yiddish and Hebrew, which he finally ends up. And he will 
skew, he will bypass the curse, the malediction. Instead of syntax, he will choose the structure. In the Arabic vocabulary, he will prefer the Talmudic construction, construction and therefore will invent the Hebrew narrative, the Jewish novel, what we call the Jewish novel. And he was really the first. And, uh, and my question is, uh, uh, you know, at this moment, he was, uh, 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 this moment was really special because he, he, he was born at the, at the end of the 18th, 19th century and he died in the, big, in the early beginning of the, of the 20th century in, in, when he was 40, yeah, in 24. So, and he was, uh, uh, he was, um, uh, he has a, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of consideration about Hermann Cohen and Rosenzweig. But Hermann Cohen was saying at this moment that finally German is the highest culture and German plus Jewish it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the way of the universality. And Rosenzweig in the Stern say it's not true. And so Kafka finally was the first uh, intellect, Jewish intellectual who feels that something was missing, that, and that something was happening. Remember, in 1921, uh, Sigmund Freud wrote that there is a kind of people, you know, there is a, 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 what we call the, 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 the fool of Francais, I'm sorry. The I, I lose my, my uh, the crowd, the crowd. And he said there is artificial crowd and there is natural crowd. And even in the art artificial crowd, there is the, uh, uh, the, he mentioned only army and church. Mm -hmm. And what he was doing, uh, uh, Kafka, he was men mentioning the administration. So what, 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 what brings uh, Kafka more than the others? Um, <laughs> thank you so much. I, I, was, I, was, I was, I was, my, yes. my, my, my question is really hidden. I, I understand this. <laughs> yeah, somehow, it's, it's a, a, it's a, a mysterious of the question. Night. Uh, it's a mysterious question. I, I feel like uh, standing in front of an amulet. From a what? From an amulet. I have to decipher the deeper sense of your question. But I, let me put, uh, I think it's a very complex question. Very, um, I would pick up one it's moment. It's a hidden conference. Yeah. <laughs> no, one moment I think it's really important and uh, I'm glad you bring it up. It's, it's the language. And... Um, it is very true that we have to take into the consideration the, let's say, the historical and cultural context in which Kafka was yes. writing and thinking. And, and it's this Austro-Hungarian, and it, in his case, especially the Bohemian context, yes. Prague, in early 20th century. And then, of course, the, the breaking of, at the end of the World War, the breaking, uh, breaking together of, uh, let's say, the, the, the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and at that moment, Czechoslovakia was founded, and it was a new and a Czech, a Czech state in 1919. Um, German disappeared as an official language, but this was relatively late in Kafka's life. But interesting is that Kafka, he was really um, studying Czech. He was able to, to speak Czech, and he was writing in Czech. All his official writings, for the office, he was working in the insurance company for yeah. workers. Um, he wrote in Czech after yeah. 1990, before in German, and then he just moved to Czech. Yeah. It was no problem for him. What do we see in that case? So he was he was writing and living in a multilingual um, context, where German and Czech was at the same time spoken, and politically it shifted towards the Czech in 1919. Um, but where is actually, where is the Jewish in that? And uh, the, the interesting point in you is, you say, uh, I think it's absolutely correct, that the big move of the Jews in Europe, the European Jews, to the national languages of their countries, like uh, the German Jews speaking German, and it's, it's a big part of European Jews speak German. The, in France they turn to, to French, in Italy to Italian. So they, they gave up their, let's say, their idiom, mostly Yiddish, 
yeah. but also other languages, Spanish and so on. But mostly the Yiddish, they, they started to give up. And um, Kafka was living in a time where Yiddish has been given up since many decades. And he was, co in contrast to that, um, renewing the Yiddish. He gave uh, actually one of the, the only of, um, sp speak that Kafka gave was to speak on the Yiddish language in the Jewish uh, town hall in Prague. But it was, it was like a confrontation to the letter he sent to his father. Somehow. Somehow. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, he was really he's saying, yeah. I am, um, let's say, not even fond of this language. This, this language is important. It's, it shows us something. It shows us how the languages are kind of ex-territorial fields of culture. They mix cultures. And he presents us Yiddish as a language which, which is existing only out of... Um, um, now I have, don't have the English word, Fremdworte. Um, French. What? French. Fremdworte. Um, uh, uh, say? Wo words that are not belonging to a specific language yeah. that are kind of migrating words. Yeah. Universal. Esperanto. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yiddish is, is a composition, a mixture of different <coughs> languages. Yeah. It's universal, not an old huh? language. Universal. It's universal. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> it's a hybrid language, exactly. So Kafka is very much stressing that moment. It's, it's, it's not a language which has any identity. It's a very hybrid language. And on the other hand, he's studying Hebrew. He yeah. takes Hebrew yeah. lessons, like Jenny and the colleagues. <laughs> so it's a good company. <laughs> uh, what is interesting, he's making a lot of jokes about Hebrew learning. Yeah. Because uh, he says, um, in the summer we start with our Hebrew lessons. We come to lesson one, two, three, four, five, and then we make a break, and then we forget everything when we start at the beginning. <laughs> on. And this uh, they do for years. <laughs> so you're in good company if you forget your Hebrew all the time. Yeah. But what, uh, what does this show? Um, that through language, um, you kind of um, find and at the same time lose your connection to whatever is cultural identity. Exactly. Can, can I add something yeah. to this? No. It's interesting. It's interesting how this relates, this question of language relates then back to Rembrandt because he engages in both the visual and literary language. He's actually using Aramaic, he's using Hebrew, he's using Latin, and he's using the visual imagery. And actually the visual imagery, sometimes it swaps. You start reading the visual imagery and the language itself starts acting as a picture. So there is also this complicated relationship of what is language not just spoken, but the visible, the visible and invisible, the auditory, it's all present in Rembrandt. So there's a nice mm. parallel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andreas. I would like to, uh, yeah, please. I was just saying that he also was very influenced in the theater aspect, first mm -hmm. of all. Yiddish theater. Yes, it's true. It's just not a, a, a group from Prague. There were there's a group from uh, yeah, from the Eastern the Jewish context. Yeah, the they travel the around yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Vil it was a troop from a troop from Vilna, yeah, yeah. and uh, Prague was quite German. It, there was a very German aspect in, in Prague culture where Kafka yes. grew up. But it's very it's, you are absolutely right that this was for Kafka an initial moment to to see this Yiddish theater plays. Yeah. Actually, this is what brought him back to Judaism. Thank you. So I would like thank you so much for your for your answer and for your clarity. So I want I thank you. And I want now to to uh, to come back to to Zenia. One more minute. So Zenia, thank I'm you quick. so much for your presentation. Uh, I just want to I I, I really uh, I really appreciate what, what you say. It's a beginning too, as as you say that there is a connection and a real connection between uh, Rembrandt and Kafka, and especially with what we, with what we saw, with a picture of uh, Felice Bauer and, and Kafka, mm -hmm. and the picture of the uh, Jewish bride. And this is really important because finally Rembrandt 
uh, uh, make, made this, uh, this uh, painting, uh, the Jewish bride was supposed to be uh, Isaac and Rebecca. And, uh, uh, but they don't, like, they don't like Jewish, you know, they don't like Jewish. And he put inside, it was the French writer Jean Genet used to say that the, the, the how you call this, la manche? The sleeve. The sleeve. The sleeve of the bride is look like an abstract, an abstract arc. Mm -hmm. But I want, to, I, I want to, to point something very important that you, sh that you, you, you mentioned, you show. Uh, you, saw the you, you saw the first, uh, the first painting you, you were saying about Balthazar. Yes. Balthazar, okay, Balthazar. Mm -hmm. And uh, after we saw many more. But you might understand that at one moment of his life, Rembrandt has to stop, has to begin, has to make a new life, to turn a page on his life. It's in 1642, when he loses his wife. Because before, he was a great artist, he was really well known, <coughs> he, 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 he had a lot of money, and he was always painting things with a lot of gold, a lot of lights, a lot of incredible things that you see in the first, in, in the, in the first, uh, uh, picture in the first uh, frame you, you show, the first painting. And after, after 1642, it's, he is removing all of this. He is removing all of this because he doesn't consider is, there is an importance because finally he's going to lose everything. And at the end of his life, at the end of his life, he has nothing and obliged to sell his paintings too. So he has this really uh, 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 special life. But my question is, my question is, and is really related to, uh, to, uh, to the relation, and maybe on Kabbalah, and to his relation who is, who is constructing day by day, painting after paintings, and drawing after dra drawing, or engraving after engraving. We feel in, uh, in Rembrandt that uh, 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 the man and the creator are on the same eyes. It's the same people, it's the same person. It's what you, you say about Daniel, that we are all Daniel looking at the picture. Mm -hmm. But after, he do something, he do a job completely different. And it's hardly any more imperious act of second creation, it's an act of second creation, as just Steiner uh, wrote of more radical challenge to his own unwanted, uncontrolled world coming than in the series of self-portrait painting by Rembrandt. Here, in a material way, the creator of men is a man. Where to find a wilder, wilder ins insurrection against the other creator? So, what I will ask you, do you think that it's, uh, 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 of course he has na Jewish neighbors, but you don't think it's a, it's a kind of, of revolt, uh, revolution for himself against God and say, I'm, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do things like, like you, 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 you can do. I, I can be a creator as you are. I, I can make my own Kabbalah. I can make my own symbolic. What do you think about that? Um, well, I think it's an interesting idea of God and men, and the relationship in Judaism, as I mentioned, between God and men. And I think Rembrandt takes this idea from Judaism and he shifts it from God and men to creator, or God who is the artist, and men who is the viewer or the witness. And so we actually, in some ways, step away from, a, if we take the religious module or formula, and then we turn back to what is human. And here we find a very curious parallel that all the roles are reversed because he says, I am the creator, the Rhine, I made this, I'm in the center. But then he says, this means nothing if you, the viewer, can't read it. So who is the creator? Who's the reader of the message? So it shifts again. So it's this incredibly selfish statement and incredibly humble statement, right? It's, it's showing the possibility and believing in possibility that he believes in humanity and he believes in his viewer. And I think like any great artist, he was painting this not just for the men of his time, the women, the human beings of his time, but he was painting it for 2017 AGU lecture. He was waiting for you to come in 
and relate to it. And I mean, it's such an amazing gift. Um, and I have to share a, a personal anecdote because we were so excited. We actually dreamt with Andreas to do something together. We proposed it to Christian and said, you know, how can we link it together? And we, 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 we sold it to AGU. They were excited. We had Judaism, everything fit. And then we got on Skype and we said, well, what does Rembrandt and Kafka have in common? And we said, absolutely nothing, right? <laughs> That's different centuries. You know, one is Jewish, the other one is not. And then Andreas actually uh, shared something that, that, that moved my heart. And uh, do you want to tell them about the book? Yeah. yeah. You mean the Simu? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it turned out that uh, Kafka wrote the book on Rembrandt by Georg Simu. Um, and he gave it away. He describes it because he gave it away to a publisher let's say to a, to a friend and publisher um, and it's not clear what it means to give away a book it can mean it's not so precious to me it can also mean it's very precious to me it's up to our interpretation I think but it's it's really significant that he chose it uh, because the publisher um, didn't have um, the means to pay him but he said I can okay. instead uh, yeah give you some presents as books he chose it and later give it away. And so it's, it's an interesting detail, but uh, Gina can continue because you read it. <laughs> so, yes, so I actually wanted to read the book because I wanted to see if we can find something that would relate. And maybe this would be a great way to end because I know it's been a long evening. And thank you for your patience. And of course, you're welcome to ask us questions as we will stay a little bit um, to say goodbye. But uh, this quote by Simo I thought was really interesting. And uh, to walk away, to keep this in your heart. Uh, what is Rembrandt? What is Kafka? What is the hidden? What are we to take away from today? And Simmel writes, of course, the completed phenomenon of art can be categorized according to a variety of formal and substantial points of view, thereby splitting into a number of separate impressions. So we can dissect it, we can dig in it, we can do our PowerPoints and explain it. But no more than a living being can be animated from the dismembered limbs on a dissection bench can a work of art reassembled out of such elements to be recreated and thereby rendered intelligible. So what I'm saying is, forget all of everything we said, there's so much more. And I hope you continue the journey and discover it yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you.